Welcome to Mission Minded, the podcast where we explore outside the box thinking in carrying out Christ's great commission. On today's episode, we're joined by Steve Richardson, president of Pioneers USA. Steve was raised in Indonesia where his parents planted churches in a jungle tribe. He witnessed the impact of the gospel on their warlike society, a story documented in his father's missionary classic, Peace Child. Steve and his wife, Arlene, also spent 11 years planting churches among an unreached people group in Southeast Asia. On today's podcast, we discuss Steve's new book, Is the Commission Still Great? Steve uses stories from scripture, history, and his own ministry experience to impart timely lessons on modern missions. Now here's your host, Kristen and John. Well, thank you for joining us today, Steve, all the way from Orlando. Thank you, Kristen, for having me. Absolutely. You guys have fared well through the hurricane. Everything going all right? Yeah, reasonably well. Some fairly, uh, the street's pretty full of water, but our home and quarters are fine here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Well, Steve, you are the president of Pioneers USA. We're really honored to have you here today. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement in global missions. So it's uh, quite a story when I start telling my story to somebody on a flight, they start thinking after a while I'm pulling their leg. <laughs> uh, so, so I, my parents and I, I was six months old at the time, left on a ship from Vancouver back in 62 and found ourselves with a tribe of cannibal headhunters in the southern swamps of New Guinea. They lived in tree houses 40 or 50 feet off the surface of the swamp. And uh, that's where I grew up. And as mom and dad learned the language well enough to begin explaining the gospel to them, to their shock, they thought Judas was the hero of the story. And my dad said to the leaders there in that smoky manhouse, you know, in the village, no, you mean Jesus. And they said, no, Judas, he sounds like one of us. And he realized he had a cross-cultural challenge on his hands. And that led to, you know, a lot of prayer and ultimately convincing the Sawi villages that had moved in around us, who wanted to be near us, but not close to each other, to make peace. And that always wondered in a treachery honoring society, how do they convince each other that they're serious about making peace? And what happened is that one of the fathers from the village of Kamur ran with his child over to the enemy village, Hainam, gave that child in a ceremony that they called uh, Tarop, come on. And it was a peace child being given. And that village later reciprocated. And as mom and dad compared notes, they realized, you know, not only this is this strange, but it's strangely familiar. Two parties at war. One, one party wanting so much to establish peace that they're willing to give their son, their only son to the enemy. I mean, that's the gospel in a nutshell. So Mm. Uh, Dad started explaining the whole gospel message once again, using a few new vocabulary words, explaining that Jesus was Mialkodon's Tarop team, God's peace child. Mm. And one after another, the chief started coming. There was no more joking. It was just incredible. So so there was a breakthrough among the Sawi. And as a boy, I grew up just with a front row seat, uh, witnessing the power of Romans 116. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. And, you know, growing up, I just realized, you know, this is the real thing. I participated in my parents' ministry. And uh, that was the foundation for for a lifetime of of serving God in cross-cultural ministry. Well, Steve, um, you know, a lot of our listeners are connected to iTech, and they're going to be familiar with the end of the Spear story. And when I think back of, you know, 20th century, the iconic missionary stories, you know, the end of the Spear, Nate, St. Jim Elliott, that story, and also, you know, your your story, your parents' story, the peace child. And I would encourage anybody, you know, there's the, your father you wrote the book Peace Child, and now uh, was it just last year, the the youth edition, the treachery yes. on the Twisted River, and, we, you know, we'll, we'll put some show notes here. We'd encourage people to read. These are the stories you need to be telling to the next generation. Um, and and so, yeah, so we, we – um, could you tell us about your in-laws – because that that's another story that's pretty wild too. You you come from a, a bilateral missions family, and and I I wasn't really that familiar with you know the story of pioneers. I right. Mean, and and that's another book I'd recommend is when God comes calling. If you could just give us a you know a similar rundown of your your in laws and and how pioneers came to be 
So uh, I was a senior in high school. My dad came back from one of his speaking trips and he said, Steve, I found a young lady that I think would be perfect for you. <laughs> and my interest was piqued. I was in Pasadena, California. I said, so where is she? He said in Washington, DC. I said, tell me more. He said, well, her family is just starting a, a ministry in their home. It's called World Evangelical Outreach. And she loves missions. I said, is she beautiful? He said, yes. So he said, why didn't you write her a letter? So I picked out my dad's Institute of Tribal People Studies stationery and I wrote a letter to Arlene. And we ended up becoming pen pals, which is an early version of Facebook. <laughs> and uh, we, we corresponded and God brought us together. We ended up getting married and Arlene's parents, this little ministry that they were starting in their home there in the Washington DC area uh, is what became Pioneers. They changed the name later. And uh, so we got married in 83. And uh, there were probably 20 people involved at the time. And it's about like just, iTech. I mean, it was an incredible ride, John. Just uh, over the years, Arlene and I packed four suitcases and became some of the early Pioneers missionaries headed off to Southeast Asia to one of the major Muslim unreached people groups there. And uh, eventually we have teams all across that country and other countries and God is just blessed. We, we've got about 3,200 workers now in uh, around a hundred countries around the world. And it was started, my, my father-in-law, Ted Fletcher, uh, you mentioned he came out of the business world it, 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 one of these unlikely characters that God <laughs> called, but he knew he didn't know everything and he was just loved evangelism, sharing the gospel, had a heart for the world. And it's just a phenomenal story. So yeah, you're right. It's a little bit like two missions. Well, the, what was the saying? Yeah. Too, too old, no Bible degree and too many kids. And, you yeah. got, and your, your father-in-law was turned down and then somebody told him that maybe God's calling you to start an agency for people like you. Yeah, you got it. There's a, the family still has a little notebook of the the gracious rejection letters from <laughs> about a dozen different agencies. Well, eventually we, we want to talk about your book here, but I did I did want to say, you know, um, my wife and I got to visit Pioneers a few years ago and um, spend a, a couple of days there and just really impressed the organization. I remember Rob Wassel speaking to the group and he said, you know, we want everybody from the the president down to the housekeeping staff to be able to clearly tell people what pioneers about. We're about revelation five, nine and seven, nine, you know, about unreached people groups, about every tribe, nation, language and tongue. And, and so we were just really impressed. And I remember telling my wife when we left there, I said, if we ever go overseas long-term, this is the agency we need to go with. And uh, so we, we followed you guys. Um, we got to actually got to visit some, some of your uh, teams in North central Africa back in March. We really enjoyed our time and just been, wow, wonderful. just been impressed with uh the work that um, you, know, you and your organization are doing. So just want to. Thank you, know. John. And we sure appreciate you and your ministry as well. And the opportunities we've had to collaborate over the years. We, it's all hands on deck. That's right. Amen to that. Right. So. Well, you have a book coming out really soon. It'll be out. <clears throat> excuse me. By the time this podcast episode is tomorrow, released. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the great commission still great? Um, what prompted you to write this book? Tell us a little bit about that. So here is the book. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story. It's probably 20 years ago. I spoke at a church outside Philadelphia. And I was sharing some of the amazing things that God is doing around the world. And afterward, an elderly lady was one of the people that came up to talk to me after the service. And she, she literally had a few tears coming down her cheeks. And she said, you know, I've been praying and giving for years, but it's like God spoke to me in, today and said, your uh, sacrificial involvement is making a big difference. Mm. And I was encouraged, but it, it got me thinking, okay, so here she had been for years praying and giving, but wondering if it was really making a difference. I wonder what other misperceptions people might have that uh, could be demotivating them or at least preventing them from participating as wholeheartedly and as enthusiastically as they would other by, otherwise be doing. 
So I started actually collecting some ideas and having conversations with different people in my travels and asking, so what do you think are some of the myths about missions out there, or at least things that people are exaggerating in their minds or underappreciating that might be under undermining their participation and enthusiasm? And then I did a survey, an informal survey, and about 120 people participated. Some of them were mission pastors, others were rank and file uh, believers uh, in churches across the country, others were missionaries. And I distilled the list to this, this final group of eight concepts that I think need clarifying mm -hmm. so that people will have a clearer, more distinct you know, picture of our participation in this final lap of the Great Commission uh, race. That, that's the background story. So, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, at, maybe it was one of these pandemic blessings, you know, the silver lining <laughs> in an otherwise bleak picture. I just started taking these conversations and the survey and started fleshing them out. And uh, a couple of missions pastors have already said that this is perhaps one of the best and most helpful missions books that they've read in, in quite a few years. And so I'm hoping it'll be a blessing to churches. Uh, it's, it's organized around the idea of having small group discussions on these perceptions. I, I'm not trying to set up straw men, Kristen or John, just you know to you know, present only one side of the equation. I think there's a kernel of truth to many of these ideas. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to help people process those ideas in a biblical fashion. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You've identified um, eight myths. Um, can you highlight one or two of those for us? Yeah. So I think one of the most foundational is, you know, what I could call a side salad perception about the Great Commission. And when I say Great Commission, I'm not just referring to Matthew 28, uh, 18 to 20. I'm thinking of the whole biblical narrative about the big picture of what God is doing in the world. But, you know, a Barna survey was done uh, just a couple of years back where they found that 51% of churchgoers in America have no clue what the Great Commission is. They don't even recognize mm -hmm. the expression. And then there's another 37% apparently that if you give them a list of references, uh, they're, they're not going to know which reference represents the Great Commission as we know it in Matthew. And I think that we in the North American church are in danger of starting to become missionless believers mm -hmm. in the sense that we, we kind of think nothing significant happened between the resurrection and the ascension when actually Jesus had five different, mm -hmm. likely distinct conversations with five different groups of people, emphasizing what he wants us to be doing uh, during the church age. And it's very likely that the actual Great Commission, the primary one of the, of the five that we think of as the Great Commission was given to 500 people on the mountain there in Galilee. So I think just, just seeing missions as core to who we are and what God has for us to do uh, is really, really key. It's not, not a side salad. It's not peripheral. So that would be one of them. Steve, before you move to the second one, it, I just, yeah. you, you mentioned Great Commission and, um, you know, the five Great Commissions, you know, Marvin Newell, um, another book I'd recommend, the, the, A Third of Us, he talks, he goes through those, the five different Great Commission passages. Um and one of the things I mentioned this earlier, we I listened to a, a Missio Nexus uh, podcast with Marvin Newell, and and someone asked if Isaiah one seventeen was the new Great Commission. In what sense? And and they they this is um, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow, and and I would agree these things are important, but. It concerned me that in in 2022, and this is a this is not just an average. This is Missio Nexus. Someone's asking if this is replacing the Great Commission. You know that this and and so um, I I I see the need for a book like yours. If if we start if we shift away from this you know Great Commission of 
discipleship and evangelism to becoming, you know, social, you know, social concern, which that that is important to the heart of God. But it, could you comment on that in terms of your trend, you know, what you're seeing um, in terms of people's knowledge? You talked about the Barna report, right? And and go ahead, sorry. <clears throat> no, yeah, and that actually relates to one of the other myths that I unpack in one of the other chapters, and that is the sense that missions is everything. And all, all good outreach-related activities qualify as missions. Um, and they're obviously a part of the overall mission that God has called us to. But when we talk about missions uh, in the sense of seeing Jesus known and glorified among all the country, uh, cultures of the world, uh, that's a very that's a very special and comprehensive and intentionality requiring calling that God has given to all of us as believers. And uh, you know, there's this term genericizing, <laughs> like in Indonesia, uh, people use the term Honda for any kind of motorcycle. So, <laughs> no, people we call ask them you, Chandas okay, around here, the yeah, the knockoff Hondas. Yeah, so you'll hear a conversation like this. Hey, do you have a Honda? Yeah, it's a Suzuki <laughs> or a Yamaha or a Kawasaki. And uh, so I, I, our intent is not to, to create tiers and second class categories of activity, but uh, the cross-cultural communication of the gospel to the ethne of the world. Uh, is a special task that requires intentionality and requires uh, requires specific vocabulary if we're going to be able to talk about it and pursue it uh, actively and consciously and with intelligence. So you're right, and I think in our culture and around the world, there's there's a trend. Uh, it's actually a dangerous trend mm. to replace gospel proclamation mm. and discipleship mm. with a lot of other good activities, and ironically. It, the more concerned we are about the social ills of the world around us, the more critical it is that the gospel is proclaimed and understood and the disciples are made. That's the foundation for change. Would you agree? Yes. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's, um, you know, it, it's, it makes me think of another book from one of the pioneers, you know, when everything is missions, you know, when the, the, the Denny Spitters and, and Matthew Ellison, you know, when everything is missions, nothing is missions. And, yes. and it and and it's it's well intentioned of not like you said not trying to pedestal people or not make anyone feel left out but I like I like John Piper you know this idea that the wartime life we all contribute to the war effort you know we all we all make sacrifices but we're not all you know we don't say that we're all you know on the front line fighting we're all contributing to that effort and so I, I do I'm glad I'm excited to see what you you have in in this book. Um, just because, um, yeah, the trends that, you know, I, one of the things they talk about when everything is missions is, you know, when you focus on a social ill in society and that's all you go after and you don't go after the, the ultimate problem of sin and the underlying that, then you don't get either one, you know, you don't. Right. And it talks about when in places where you see gospel proclamation and church planting, that's when you see the transformation of society. And so I, I, I think it is it's good for us to reiterate these things of, you know, of, of, of sin and the gospel. You know, Jesus came to, re, you know, redeem and make all things new. And so that has to happen if we want to see true societal change. So, John, an example of that is uh, a sociologist named Robert Woodbury did a Ph.D. study on uh, the impact of Protestant missions in West Africa. And he came away with the surprising conclusion that if you wanted a thriving democracy with thriving social institutions, get in a time machine, go back into the 1800s and send Protestant missionaries to these countries. Mm. Uh, it was just fascinating. And I experienced that growing up you know, among the Sawi. Mm. And it was the breakthrough of the, of the gospel message that actually ended up preserving their culture. Mm and preserving their language because so many languages are disappearing but if they have the bible in their language if they're having church services in their own language and when we went back 50 years later my father and my brothers and i it's recorded in this video never the same on youtube uh 
we found that the Sawi still, and I could still understand it. I could I had a hard time speaking Sawi. I mostly used Indonesian because I, I understood Indonesian more. But anyway, they love their language. And decades later, it was still being preserved and their culture was being preserved. Why? Because sympathetic outsiders arrived, learned their language and culture, and uh, incarnated the love of God, you know, within their their society. So it's it's fantastic. I, th I think so many people need to hear that positive message. Well, and it's interesting too with the parallels of the Waudani story of people who are critical. It's like you know the Waudani would have died out. You know the the sixty yes. percent homicide rate among the males. You know it's. You know, the Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint bringing the gospel to these to this tribe is actually what preserved the tribe. And and so so it's it's, you know, it's interesting. A lot of these 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 ideas that are passed around, but really aren't thinking underneath of like what you say, preserving the language, preserving the culture. Um, you know, again, like with the Sawi, you know, the cannibalistic tribe, they they wouldn't have, they weren't on a trajectory to, to survive. You know, people have this impression that they're living in some sort of utopia there until the missionaries arrive. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. It's a wonder they even survived, you know, given the diseases and mm. warfare and everything else. So yeah, you're right. The Wadani and others, just hundreds and hundreds of groups around the world. And that, that's another, you know, I think this book covers uh, quite a few of the key pressure points. Okay. And, you know, we had a daughter went off to uh, secular university and mm -hmm. in the anthropology courses i mean they were relentlessly going after missionaries and so forth and and you, you start realizing wait a minute now are we going to be able to keep these people isolated forever i mean aren't isn't modernity going to reach them at some point <laughs> and is it frankly most missionaries today aren't necessarily going to isolated tribes and most missionaries aren't from the West. For every Western missionary, there's probably 10 to 20 from other countries. So, you know, there's a whole chapter on do missionaries harm, you know, missionaries are harmful mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. So Steve, how do you respond to those who say or believe that missions, international missions is obsolete or harmful? What is your response to that? Well, uh, it depends on if they're believers or sure. not. <laughs> sure. I would say, but but uh, and it'd be slightly different on those two points. But in terms of harmful, my experience has been the only people from whom I've heard that charge uh, is outsiders, Westerners, mm -hmm. basically. I have personally never heard uh, someone from a culture that has received missionaries in the last five or six decades ever complain that the missionaries came. Mm. And I've participated in quite a few of these 50 year anniversary celebrations or other celebrations where literally thousands of people will gather in a jungle amphitheater. And uh, they'll tell the stories of how they used to live. And this goes on for a couple of days. And then they reenact how the first missionaries came and brought all their baggage and all the all the funny experiences and, and uh, all their linguistic faux pas and foibles. And then they'll start talking about the impact that the gospel made. And then they'll start dancing and just incredible rejoicing. And that is not the reaction of an exploited people. Mm. That is not the reaction of people who are resentful, you know, that the missionaries came. So anyway, but, you know, as far as Westerners going. Um, first of all, I think the Bible is clear. Uh, as believers, it's not optional to have flesh and blood mm. in investment and obedience in the Great Commission. Mm. I suspect others may disagree that if we stop sending our own flesh and blood altogether, it'll only be a generation at the most two before we stop sending money as well. Mm. And, and a, a final thought among many is that I believe mission engagement, strategic mission engagement, which normally will involve some aspect of sending, is really healthy for the sending church. And it's not a win-lose proposition. Mm 
it's a win-win proposition. And some of the healthiest churches that I've seen across the US and North America are churches that have a vibrant missions. It's integrated into their ministry and their culture. It's not just a tag on. And, uh, it, it, you know, churches, I've seen them kind of go through a life cycle and the golden age for many churches, both locally and globally, is when the Great Commission is a central part of who they are as a, as a congregation. Well, that's, um, and I think that's one of the points of making whatever you think is missions. When you focus on the ends of the earth, you get everything in between. Yes. And, and not this it. either or concept, you know, it's not Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, or, 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 or it's and, and, and all across. And um, I, I, you know, John Piper makes a comment about, you know, this idea of people wanting, oh, we're just going to send our money. And he, and he talks about, we, 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 we can't say we're going to let somebody else, you know, send their sons and daughters into harm's way and we're not going to, you know, and he talks about the danger of that, of what you said. I haven't thought about what you just said. If we stop sending our, our people, then eventually we'll stop sending our money as well. So. Yeah, I think it's a matter of time. And, you know, frankly, in the New, New Testament church and the early few centuries, it started with such outward passion. Hmm. Um, and, and moving through the Roman Empire, but there came a point where churches became inwardly focused. And eventually those, those uh, regions surrounding the Mediterranean actually got run over, you could say by unevangelized peoples to whom the gospel had not come because the mission vision had been lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, historically that has happened, you know, fairly frequently. Well, from your perspective as the leader of a sending agency, how has the missions landscape changed? Um, and how is this impacting the Western church's involvement? Yeah, really good question. Uh, just in the last 50 years or so, uh, just, just 50 years ago, about 70% of the Christians in the world were in the West. Today's the reverse. And <clears throat> so that it, it's, it's really a testimony to the power of missions over the last few decades. Uh, and not only is the church multiplying to the tune of something like 100,000 new baby believers every day, but the global church is catching a vision for their own missionary capacity and ambitions and participation. So that means that while I'm definitely trying to encourage the church and the West to stay in the race right until the finish line, I think, the, I, I think we do need to be constantly looking at what is our best contribution. And I think that, um, we have gifts in encouraging other parts of the body of Christ. We have, we have gifts catalytically. We're, we're creative thinkers. We're taught to kind of think outside the box and contemplate new possibilities. Uh, we're good at connecting and networking. Now, the whole church around the world is getting better and better at that, obviously. But we're good networkers. God has still given us tremendous resources historically and otherwise to share with the global church. And I think there's still a place for pioneering as well. We have some access to some places that other people don't easily have. So all that to say it's an era for collaboration, for humble service, and for pursuing um, synergistic strategies in close communication and collaboration with the global church. It's an exciting era. It, I mean, it's like, I, I asked one of our daughters, you know, when she was small, when she was eight, we were on a father daughter date. Kelly, if you could choose any time in which to live or be born, when would you choose? And she said, maybe when Jesus was walking on earth so I could see him do miracles. And then she mm -hmm. thought for a minute and said, dad, did they have Burger King back then? <laughs> <laughs> she was counting the cost. <laughs> And we agreed actually today, you know, and in terms of the harvest, it's fantastic. Go ahead, John. Well, well counting the cost, that was the theme for Missio yes. Nexus and uh, this, this last week, the Missio Nexus conference. And, and I just like to know, I mean, we, Missio Nexus got to hear Mary, Cho, uh, Mary Ho speak Wednesday night. And, and for those who don't know, the, 
the director of all nations, the group that sent John Allen Chow uh, to the you know Sentinel Islands and who was killed. And you know, the, Ed Stetzer wrote an article in the Washington Post in response to that. And I'd like to get your comments. Uh, you know, obviously the end of the Spear story is near and dear to oh, iTech. Yeah. And, and, you know, in 1956, when Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and those guys died, it fueled people to go on the field. And, and, and Steve Saint wrote an article after John Allen Chow died called Must We Obey? And just responding to just where we're at in our evangelical culture in, in, you know, in 2018 when John Allen Chow died versus in 1956. And in, 19, in 2018, people are asking, should we be doing this? You yes. know, and so, so I just like to get your perspective. You know, you're you're the leader of a set. You you make decisions. You know, you send people into, you know, some some dangerous places. And so, just your perspective as a as a as a missions leader, but also just the trends that you're seeing in the in the you know the response of our culture in 1956 versus in 20, 2018. Yeah, exactly. So in 1956, you know, was it Life magazine that had mm -hmm. the spread and the title? Uh, was it Go Preach the Gospel, Five Do and Die? Some do Something and die, right, yeah, Five Do and Die. And uh, what a contrast in the society at large with respect to their attitude toward Christians and toward even missions at that time compared to what it was just, just a few years ago where it was highly critical and so th this really, the, the, the whole thing about missions being harmful, but as far as we're concerned with the church here in, in the West, I, I, my observation is we're becoming more and more safety conscious. Mm. I mean, it's an epidemic. Mm. And uh, it, it's almost become one of our idols, you know, if, mm. if I could be presum you know, bold enough to say that. And it's something we need to wrestle with. I, I think a lot of people would do things except for the legal environment in which we live, which is another major constraint of organizations. And we try to push the boundaries and we have people in some very unexpected places around the world, obviously in security sensitive locations. So we're doing that. But I think this is another reason we need to be partnering globally because there are fellow believers from other countries who aren't under the same constraints or inhibitions mm -hmm. culturally and uh, legally. Uh, and they can be going into these places and we, we can be helping them and you know, providing some of the support things. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a real shame, uh, but it's part of, the, part of the world we're living in today. So it's happening both outside the church and it's seeping in in major ways, even within the church. I, my parents carrying me in when I was six months old and, you know, landing on the shore there of the river with 400 fully armed headhunters waiting to welcome us. I mean, what self-respecting mission agency would allow that to happen today? <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, but I am encouraged by your story of your parents' willingness to, yes. you know, and, and I, I, I think about even like, you know, our, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln writing the letter to Mrs. Bixby, you know, you know, and he tells when her sons died in the, in the, in the, in the revolution, in the civil war and says, you know, he talked about the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. And, and I, 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 I just see where we're at, you know, in our culture, just moving away from, uh, and so I, 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 I do, I do want to see us get, you know, it, it's a, as a church culture where we, where we value that we value sacrifice. We, you know, we, we have to counter the, you know, and, and, and I don't know exactly what you say in your book, but I, I would like, what, what would, what would you say? To where we get back, you know, Dick Brogdon spoke last week at Missio Nexus. Pretty a lot of those things you're talking about about taking risk and how risk averse we've become. So what do you, what would you say? I mean, you deal with young, you know, you mobilize people. What, what would you say to uh, you know parents? I mean, you've you've obviously had um, uh, the Beckett. Uh, is that her name, Beckett? Um, yeah, Cheryl. You have a you have a building named after a, a young, relatively recently killed in Afghanistan. 
Um, so what would you say, if it's a two-part question, what would you say to parents, um, safety-conscious parents, and, and what would you say needs to happen in order for us to get back to a place where we really value um, sacrifice and we, you know, we, we make that um, something that we, you know, even like when Paul says, honor men like him, Epaphroditus, who nearly died for the sake of the gospel. You know, how do we, how do we create that culture within the church Again, you know, if may have been, maybe again isn't the right always the right word, but how do we get that? Yeah, I rediscover the the privilege uh, of of suffering mm. for the gospel, as Paul said. I think we have a hard time relating to some of the statements that Paul and others make mm. about uh, the the value in heaven's economy of this short window of opportunity that we have to actually sacrifice and suffer. Hmm. Yeah. Um, to parents, that's a hard one because I, you know, I, I can only imagine the sorts of concerns uh, that go through our minds as parents and grandparents even. But, but I, I would say this, that, that biblically, entrusting our loved ones into God's hands is a completely responsible thing to do. Yes. And there's nothing that can event, eventuate uh, that uh, escapes the filter of God's grace and sovereign control. Mm -hmm. And I think we sometimes live under the illusion that we're safer here at home driving our streets than we are serving in some foreign country. Mm. As far as the church at large, you know, I, I'm sure there's quite a few different angles in the answer to your question, but one one to me is, I think a key is the pastors and leadership of our churches. And this applies not just to our theology of suffering and including that as a regular part of the menu uh, in our church services and our teaching, but to missions in general in a broader sense. There's nothing more powerful than having leadership, senior leadership in a, in a church, in a congregation, elders and pastors who have a heart for the Great Commission and for God's glory among the nations. And I, I even suggest that the ch churches write into the job description of their, their lead pastor, uh, visiting uh, the mission field, you know, to some, some unreached context uh, at least every two years. Hmm. And and over time, that'll help change the culture of their teaching of their, and that applies to suffering as well. But, you know, I have this other book idea. I've got a few other book ideas. And one of them, John, I think you're referring to, you know, you know blind spots hmm. in, the, in the Western evangelical church. And I think the theology of suffering is one of those. Hmm. And we need to start spending more time hmm. contemplating that blind spot. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Well, Steve, what would you say to someone listening who is just discovering this this world of global missions and, and they're interested? Um, what where is the right place for them to start? Where do you they contact begin? pioneers? I know the answer. <laughs> That's the answer. Yeah, I mean, obviously, one of them is there's going to be a website coming with the book. It should go live in the next couple of days pioneers.org slash myths. And there are going to be resources there, including reading lists. And there'll be little short videos with me introducing these eight different topics. So that's one place that I'm hoping small groups will go to. I would suggest connecting with a mission-minded believer and inviting a mentoring process. And just invite that person to take you on a bit of a journey, even if it's just a few months of introducing you to that world. I, I, as, you, as you grow in your understanding, I would suggest the perspectives course. There's this, mm -hmm. this, this course that you know, many of us sort of insiders know about called you'll, Perspectives. You'll on hear the about Christian the peace movement. child in that course. <laughs> that too, yeah. But that has, that has transformed so many people's perspective on the big picture of, of you know, what God is doing historically and otherwise. So th those, those are, I think, three things that I would suggest as possibilities. One thing too, I'd add that you know that there's 
perspectives is sometimes challenging because it's only offered in certain cities. It's 15 weeks. It's three hours. There's Global Frontier Missions has made a uh, called Step In, a shorter curriculum. It's five weeks, and um, and also um, Center for Mission Mobilization in Northwest Arkansas has a Explore. So those are some one th- you know resources for churches and and you know something that's a little more easier to yes. access. You know they're they're free resources that can be done in a shorter amount of time. So just it's something to augment perspectives. Of, obviously, if you hear that and you know if there's more interest, obviously perspectives we would all encourage that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, Steve, before we wrap up, there's a lot of bad news in the world. A lot of things that have happened even recently, even just with the hurricane. Um, Can you share with us some good news from the mission world? Yeah, I'll uh, give you maybe three or four things here, popcorn fashion. So uh, even the war in Ukraine, we're seeing the church grow and just Mm -hmm. mobilized. And as, as unfortunate and um, sad as some of these sorts of world events are, uh, God is advancing, you know, the gospel in these difficult contexts. Uh, we've had workers in Afghanistan, you know, for a couple of decades, and some of them have shifted over to places like Greece. They're reporting that something like one in every 10 Afghans that reaches Greece is coming to faith in Christ. I mean, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought back in 1979 that the Ayatollah Khomeini (laughs) and the Islamic revolution would have been God's instrument Mm -hmm. to see the Persian church today be possibly the fastest growing church in the world with a growth rate of something like 20%. Six or seven Iranian churches in the city of Seoul alone. Uh, the island of New Guinea, close to home for me, when I was a baby, you know, of the 1,200 or so languages in that main island and the other li- islands around it, relatively few of them had the gospel at that time, much less thriving churches today. Almost none don't. Hmm. And that's just in, you know, the last last few decades. So God is on the move, and uh, the Holy Spirit is, is, this. this is a time of harvest. The fields are white. I could go on, but maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> well, um, Steve, yeah, I just appreciate your, you know, your your comments, and and we're excited about this book, and it should arrive tomorrow uh, for for us here. And it's <laughs> I ordered mine to have it shipped to iTech, but um, I I you know one of the things that you said um, I think is a good thing to just reiterate of the sovereignty of God even in suffering. Uh, you know, you, you made, um, you know, the, the filter, you know, John Piper kind of has a kind of combination of Matthew 10 and Romans 8, you know, that nothing can befall you except that which your loving Heavenly Father has ordained for your ultimate good. And I, I think, you know, we're seeing that even in these situations, Afghanistan, you know, uh, even Ukraine. And so um, I appreciate you, you know, reminding us of, you know, that, that God is God is at work even, you know, and when you hear stories of missionaries sowing seed in tough soil, and then years later, not maybe not even seeing fruit of their labor till years later, um, right. even after they're off the field or, or dead. Um, so, I mean, you've you've seen it on both sides of your family, you know, the and then you've you lived that yourself, and you're now involved in you know leading and sending people out. So we we just um, appreciate your perspective and again what you and your organization are doing. So, thank you so much. Um, it was actually hard for us to return here from Indonesia. It felt like a big sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I, I remember thinking to myself when the board invited us to take this role, "Oh no, our four daughters are going to have to grow up in America," <laughs> <laughs> which feels really counterintuitive, doesn't mm-hmm. it? But you know, our 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 hope and and prayer, as you've mentioned, John, is that others will have the privilege of participating in ways like we have. And uh, it's just a joy to connect the dots for churches all across the country. Well, Steve, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, We we really appreciate that. And we're looking forward to receiving our copy of Is the Commission Still Great? John's going to get his tomorrow, apparently. It's it's, according to Amazon. it, it, It said it would be delivered on October 4th, not just shipped. So, Oh, man. Okay, they must be in stock already here in Orlando (laughs) somewhere. (laughs) 
Well, thank, thank you guys for having me. I so appreciate it. Yes. And I've thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for watching the Mission Minded Podcast. Make sure to check the show notes for all of the resources mentioned today, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Mission Minded. For more information on today's topic and show notes, please visit our website, itechusa.org. Mission Minded Podcast is produced by iTech. The goal of this podcast is to inspire conversations about Great Commission participation. The views, organizations, and individuals represented, interviewed, and discussed on the podcast do not necessarily represent an official position or formal partnerships with iTech.